Yes. Well, this is the fourth message in a series called Never the Same. And it's a series about the fact that people all down through history, doesn't matter where they're at in the world, doesn't matter what their educational level, economic level, they have an encounter with this person called Jesus Christ, and their lives are never the same. And, and yet we ask the question in this series, does this make sense? Because other than the people that were there the first three and a half years when he was ministering on earth... None of the rest of the people that have had their lives completely changed. I mean, when, when Christ truly gets a hold of a heart, the change is revolutionary. It's from the inside out. Your values change. Your ways of looking at people, looking at yourself and life, everything changes. Is this rational for people that have never seen him with their eyes, never heard him with their ears? That's sort of the question we've asked through this series of messages. And the answer, I believe, is yes. And it's yes because of the pieces that we've covered uh, to, this, to this point in the series. First of all, his entrance into the world. No one has ever entered into the world the way that Christ did. Pre-announced over some 2,000 years with predictive prophecies that all converged in him. Born of a virgin and the evidence compelling that it was so. Announced by angels. No one's ever entered the world like that. And then his, his power that he displayed, his miracles. Listen, we wouldn't be talking about Jesus here and around the world today if there were not authentication that he actually performed miracles of a volume and of a kind the world has never seen before him, never seen since him. His power is why people are having their lives changed forever. And then last week we looked at his teaching. No one has ever taught the things that Jesus taught and no one has ever taught in the way that he taught. And these are some of the reasons, and what we're going to look at today, why human beings that are intelligent, thinking, mature people still encounter Jesus by his spirit, in his word, through his people, and they too are never the same. So today we want to look at his amazing grace. You know, we, we sing the song, Amazing Grace, how we're used to sing the song anyway, how sweet the sound, and so on. But... Um, Grace is something that I have found through the years that, particularly in church world, can easily be, be misunderstood. Grace, according to the Bible, uh, Greek word charis, it means God's unmerited mercy and favor. The two are important. It's favor from God that we do not deserve, and it's mercy from God that we do not deserve. The two combined is what the Bible means when it uses the word grace. And, and so grace is one of these things that it has a way of getting a hold of your heart, and in many cases, it leaves us forever changed. And grace can sneak up on you sometimes when you least expect it. I uh, came across a story about a man that, you know, got into those retirement years, and so naturally he moved to Florida because it's warm down there and it's cold up here and it just feels better down there. And so the uh, first thing he did in his retirement, he went out and bought a new Corvette. Why wouldn't he? He's retired. <laughs> He's in Florida. So he, he gets his Corvette, you know, and he's driving it off the lot, still got the, you know, the new tags on it and everything, and he gets it on the highway, and man, he has never felt power like this in an automobile before. So he squeezes down on it, and next thing you know, he's 75, 80, 85, and he's like, oh man, this is one. He squeezes a little more, he's up to about 90 miles an hour, and then the blue lights. The blue, how many have ever had the blue lights? Yeah, oh, it's, a, it's bad, it's bad. Well, he looks at the blue lights, and he says, I'm just going to go for it. He mashes down 100, 105, 110, 120. And then he stops and he says, what am I doing? Am I crazy? So he, he pulls over and he pulls the side of the road and the trooper gets up behind him. The trooper comes up says, oh, gee, new car. I can see your tags. He says, sir, I want to tell you something. I have a half hour left on my shift and I'm feeling kind of gracious today. If you can give me a reason that I've never, ever heard before, for why you were speeding, I'll let you go. Well, the old guy paused for a minute and he says, Well, about three years ago, Florida State Trooper, just like you, stole my wife from me. And when I looked in the mirror and saw the blue lights, I thought you were bringing her back. <laughs> Cop handed his license back and says, You can go, sir. Have a good day. <laughs> So grace can sneak up on you sometimes. But the real serious part of this is that uh, we human beings are so unique in that 
we can have everything in the exterior, circumstantially, just the way we would want it, although that's rare, and if we get it, we're not satisfied with it for long. But, but even if we could, the truth of the matter is we could still be terribly unhappy and without peace inside, particularly if we haven't been able to resolve guilt, regret, shame, and, and the fear and all the things that it brings. We don't do well with guilt. We just can't deal with it. There are probably people right in this room that if an analysis and an objective analysis of your life was done, a great deal of your life would show that your whole life has been revolving around trying to escape or to cope with feelings of guilt and shame and regret. And Jesus came showing that, that that's a burden that humans can't bear, and that's a burden that human beings don't have to bear. That's where his amazing grace comes in. Unresolved guilt can uh, be far from a, laugh, a laughing matter, a very serious thing. Let me read you something. This was uh, an actual excerpt from a guy. He says, I just don't know what to do. How do you let go of something that's always in your head and has become literally just a part of you? A lot of people I know must think I've always been like this, but that's not the truth, and the way I am is not good. How is it you can walk into a room and you feel like everyone knows what you're thinking and, and they're laughing at you? And if I try to explain what caused all this guilt, no one gets it. A few episodes of cheating and being cheated on between 2004 and 2006, and then I'll explain that, that I've apologized for it, and I've been apologized too. I've been forgiven and forgiven other people involved. But I can't forgive myself for what I've done. They tell me not to think about it. Just push it away whenever it comes to mind. Look how well that's worked. Here I am depressed. I feel like I don't deserve any of the good things in life that I now have. I deserve this depression since it's the only way I can ever make up for what I've done. And in a way, I welcome it when the world goes gray because I know that in some way I'm paying back the debt I owe. And so it doesn't go away, but instead I find myself fighting myself instead of fighting the depression. It's turning into something that I can't deal with. I, I want to change my name. I want to run away. Thoughts of self-injury go through my mind, not suicidal, but Nevertheless, thoughts of self-injury are never far away these days. The only thing stopping me is that's just going to make me feel even more guilty about putting my friends through that. And it ends, and, and it's anonymous. So, guilt that is unresolved and the shame and the regret that you usually are connected with it, they're no small matter. And it's not easy as human beings to resolve it. You know, we can go to a doctor, we can go to a counselor, we can talk to people, we can take drugs, we can distract ourselves with busyness and success and, and accumulation of things and new experiences, but it has a way of being the sand in the interior machinery that just makes everything grind and makes life hurt, and it has a way of just coming to the surface again and again and again. And we can't quite be comfortable in our own skin, maybe for short periods of time, but it has a way of coming back. And it can lead us to do some pretty impulsive bad things as well. So what do we do with it? The answer, the only sufficient answer that has ever been given on the planet is this grace that God offers to us through Christ. There's one particular portion of Scripture that I think gives a, a great example of this amazing grace of Christ in a way that we can all identify with it and uh, hopefully benefit from it as well. Let's turn to Luke's Gospel. In, uh, that'll be on this Bible's near you on the chair, page 731 or page 1023. And do, do turn there. Uh, page 731 or 1023. It'll be Luke chapter 7 for you that brought your, your uh, own personal Bible with you. I'll read the story, then I'll, I'll make... Uh, a few comments to give you some context on what's going on a bit better. But we're just going to look in this message today at two things that are amazing about the grace of Christ. It's availability and it's capability. It's, we're going to start in verse 36. Luke chapter 7, verse 36. 731 or 1023. Here we go. It says, Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in the town, in, or in that town, learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, 
she brought an alabaster jar of perfume and she stood behind him at his feet weeping she began to wet his feet with her tears then she wiped them with her hair kissed them and poured perfume on them when the pharisee saw who had invited him excuse, when the pharisee who had invited him saw this he said to himself if this man were a prophet he would know who is touching him and what kind of a woman she is that she's a sinner jesus answered him simon I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two men owed to a certain money lender, uh, excuse me, two men owed money to a certain money lender. One owed them 500, one owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he canceled the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and he said to Simon, picture this, he's looking at the woman, but he's talking to Simon. Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not, not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her sin, her many sins have been forgiven, past tense. For she loved much, but the one who has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests begin to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now, let me try to expand on this scene just a little bit this is the second year of Jesus three and a half year ministry it's the the year that his popularity was growing like crazy everywhere he went there would be multitudes thousands of people following him around he was quite a celebrity and it appears that the reason Simon the Pharisee had him to his house was essentially because of his celebrity status Houses of wealthy people in those biblical days, they were kind of a square formation with the buildings around the outer perimeter and a wide open court, and they would have their meals many times out in the open when the weather was good, and it was not unusual for people to just come in off the street if they were known uh, to these kinds of big dinners like this. It was also kind of a, a normal thing if a, if a rabbi were to come to your house in those days, boy, you pulled out all the stops and you tried to really, you know, uh, show honor to this rabbi. Well, you don't really see any of that happening in this, this portion of Scripture. Jesus says to Simon, you know, when I came here, you didn't give me a kiss, you didn't give me any water for my feet, you didn't give me any oil for my head. These were three common courtesies in those days. It was just a known deal that if you had a guest that you honored, when they came in, you gave them a kiss, you gave them maybe a little bit of rose oil even for their head or some olive oil, and then you gave them water for their feet common courtesy not to do so was a clear uh, expression that you don't really like or don't honor the person that you're having so it was clear that that Simon the Pharisee he didn't take Jesus too seriously Jesus was interesting he was fascinating he was a celebrity but it's clear that Simon didn't take him as a real rabbi a real teacher of God because Jesus didn't grow up in any of the rabbinical schools of the day he, he was not trained in the rabbinical schools of his day so Simon's kind of there quizzically as it were with Jesus but then Simon comes to a, a very very clear uh, opinion about Jesus when Jesus allows this woman known to be a sinful woman in the town to come in and touch him in the way that she does. Well, Simon's mind is made up. He says, if this guy was a prophet, there's no way he would let this woman even touch him. Let's focus on the woman for a minute. She comes in with her hair down. Now, today that wouldn't be a big significant deal. But in those days, once a Jewish woman was married, she put her hair up when she was out in public. And the only time she'd ever have her hair down was when she would be at home with her husband. This woman comes from the street. She's known to be a sinful woman. Her hair is down. She is weeping on Jesus and then taking her hair and wiping off the tears, almost like she's ashamed that she's bothering him. 
Let me throw this in too. The way they ate in those days, so you can get an idea of how she's at Jesus' feet, is they would, they would literally be kind of laying on the floor with their left elbow propping themselves up, and they would eat with their right hand. They must not have had hiatal hernias in those days because that's a lousy way to digest. But that's the way they ate. They're leaning on their left, left elbow, you know, handling food with their right, with their feet kind of out behind them like that. So that's how the Lord Jesus was sitting when this woman comes. Now, the woman's notorious. She is exactly what Simon said. She was a sinful woman, perhaps a prostitute. The Lord Jesus said at another time that the prostitutes were entering the kingdom of God before the religious leaders, and so that was not unusual. But the woman had her life changed forever. She was never the same because two things occurred. When, when we come, like the woman, with our inexcusable sin and our inexcusable sinfulness, I mean, when we just stop all the facades and we just own it, we are a mess. If you don't believe it, just get close to anyone. You get close enough, you will find we are all categorically a mess, desperately in need of God's grace. And when human beings come with our inexcusable sin and we're not rationalizing and we're not denying and we're not comparing and we're not legitimizing, we're just owning it, and we meet the inextinguishable love of God in Christ that is a dynamic that can leave a human being forever changed for the better. But it doesn't have to because it didn't do that to Simon. You see, what Simon didn't understand is that he was in Jesus' parable, but he never understood it. Jesus' parable, remember, he said, hey, Simon, i got something to tell you. There was one person that owed a huge debt. There was another person that owed a little debt, but neither one of them had the money to pay it off. Jesus was talking about the debt of sin that both Simon and the woman had. Jesus was going along. Sure, the woman's a worse sinner than you, Simon, but you're a sinner too. And neither of you can pay the necessary uh, sum to God to relinquish you from your guilt. Simon never got it. went right over his head. He didn't understand that he was in the parable. Because, and this is important, because Simon believed that God owed him you see, Simon believed that he was such a good man, such a religious man, that certainly he would never have any debt of sin that he would need forgiven by God. He had fulfilled all the requirements that God would, would expect of him, and so God owed him a place in his kingdom. He was better than most people. And, and folks, listen, there are people, I've actually met people like this. There are people in churches all over America that think because they are good, because they go to church, because they haven't sinned as much or as terribly as some people, that God owes them. Man, they're, they're good people. Their good deeds outweigh their bad deeds, and they're good people, and God owes them a place in his kingdom, and they don't understand that the scripture says we, we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. We all are debtors. We all need forgiveness. None of us can pay the debt. Simon didn't see that. His own pride blinded him. He was completely blind to a number of things when you look at this portion of scripture. First of all, consider this, who he's eating dinner with. He's eating dinner with God. And he's judging God. And he thinks he's holier than God. I mean, th this is an extraordinary thing. He's saying, if this guy was a prophet, he'd know who was touching him. He, he, he believes he is holier than Jesus, God in flesh. But because he had such a distorted image of God and had taught this distorted image to the people of Israel, like the rest of his ilk, it was unthinkable in their minds that God would have interest, that God would love, that God would care for, that God would touch or be touched by someone like this woman, a total blowout, complete mess loser. But Simon was wrong. And people that think that God owes them something are wrong. But people that think that God doesn't love broken, messed up, needy, scared, confused human beings are also wrong. And Jesus demonstrates this characteristic of God that makes him so worthy of worship, so worthy of love, so worthy of trust. 
his amazing grace. And that grace, when you own and see the depths of your own debt, uh, it's very, very precious and very needed. Look at some scripture to just kind of show the availability. And, and this was new to the people. that They, they couldn't believe in a God that, that just loved people of all kinds, no matter how far they appeared to be. Look at what Jesus said in Luke 15, or, or what the scripture says about Jesus. It says, now the tax collectors and sinners... Notice that wherever Jesus went, sinners were attracted to him. They weren't attracted to the religious leaders because they knew the religious leaders hated them, thought they were scum, dirt, worthy of condemnation. But they, they loved Jesus. They drew near to him. The tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around to hear him. But the Pharisees, here they go again, and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And it was true. We have a God that welcomes sinners and will joyfully sit down with them. Will we? That's, that's something we need to figure out. Will we? Jesus goes on to say, I tell you, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over what? Over what? One sinner that does what? Now, you have to get this. You, you, you see, when, when we come to God owning our sin... In all of its inexcusableness, no, no excuses, we own it, we're guilty, we, 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 just, we wish it wasn't so, but it's so, and we meet with God's inextinguishable love. Now, there's a dynamic situation. If in that case we are willing then to turn from our sin and our self-destructive living, turn from our insanity, embrace God's mercy, his unmerited mercy and favor, well, then, then we can walk away forgiven and Parties break out, according to Jesus, in heaven amongst the angels. I don't think he was being funny. I think the angels get it. They see us. They know how much God loves us. They love us too. And when they see one of us, just one, that turns back to God, that, that comes to his or her senses, they rejoice because they know the value. They know the worth of every single human life. Listen to what it says in the book of Acts chapter 10 about this forgiveness, this unmerited mercy and favor that God brings to us in Christ. It says, You know the message of God sent to all the people of Israel, telling the good news of peace through Jesus Christ or through Jesus the Messiah, who is Lord of all. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Therefore, my brothers, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Now, there's an interesting thing in America today. Usually, when the subject of God's forgiveness or his grace, his unmerited mercy and favor is presented, it's usually presented in the context that I did earlier of the psychological implications and the, the psychological torment of unresolved guilt and shame. And true as that is and serious as that is, th there's something way more serious. How many of you... Have, I, I asked this in the first service. Nobody would own up to it. Is there anybody in here who's ever had a boot put on their car? You know what a boot is? Okay. H how many know what a boot is? Can I see your hands? Okay. I remember the first time I saw one of those things in D.C. I was, I was a teenager. I was like, man, what the heck is that? You know, but then I realized. The, the, the Denver boot, as it's called, it was actually invented by a violinist, a uh, symphony violinist in Denver in about uh, 1944. They put it into use in about 1955. But anyway, here's the deal. There are people, believe it or not, you may be one, you don't have to confess it now, but there are people that go into cities in particular, and when they get a ticket, they just tear them up. They throw them in the trash. They will throw away sometimes 5, 10, 15, 20. There are people that will get hundreds and thousands of dollars worth of fines built up but they just go along uh, driving in and out of the city just like there's no penalty because nobody's doing anything. So th even though the consequences are building, 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 they just act like there really are no consequences until they see the boot. <laughs> and then it all gets real. Once the boot's on your car, you will pay your fine. You will not be free. You may have been living like there were no consequences for your offenses. Like it really didn't matter. But when the boot is on your car, you're going to pay for every single offense, those that you remember and those that you have forgotten. You're going to pay. Now here's the serious side of forgiveness that is not often presented these days in 
American society, I'll even say myself, I don't present it probably enough, but it's the truth. You see, God is a God of justice. His universe is based on law. He has laws, and you and I have broken his laws numerous times, knowingly and unknowingly, times we remember and times we have long ago forgotten. We have broken actual laws. We have consequences building up in the heavenly court system, and there is a real court system. The scripture is very honest. It says that every human being will someday stand before God to be judged. Books will be open. Every word, deed, thought, the whole nine yards. Now, I want to tell you something. It is a terrifying thought to stand before God who is completely righteous, completely holy. You cannot snow him. He knows every motive, every secret thing. And now you are going to give account for every single offense you've ever committed. And then you're going to pay for it. Uh, the scripture is very honest. It says that ultimately God's going to abolish evil in the universe. And there's going to be this, this colony where those that have rejected God's love and rejected Christ and rejected God's mercy, where they just say, all things considered, man, it's not for me. There's going to be a colony for them where they will spend eternity so that they cannot ruin the new heaven and new earth that God promises he's going to make. It's a real serious deal. And in this prison colony, they will pay for their offenses, be they small, be they great. The Bible is very honest about that. God never hides it. He'd have to do that or he would not be a worthy ruler. Nobody would trust him. He'd be unjust. He'd be like an unjust judge. You can't have confidence in him. Listen, there are holy beings in heaven that have been loyal to God, loyal to his righteousness, love him, love truth. They've never offended, and they see God letting we humans just tramp all over his law and get away with it. And they're like, whoa, 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 what's going on? What's going on? And he's like... I'm going to uphold justice. So a deterrent, God has to do two things. He has to offer somehow, find a way to offer mercy to we humans, and at the same time deter further sin and rebellion. And the way he resolved that was in Christ. Christ comes, lives this perfect, sinless, loving life, and then dies as a sacrifice, paying for my sins, all of them, your sins, all of them, so that now God can be just and yet the forgiver of sins. It's a deterrent from further sin because he only offers forgiveness for those who are repentant. Jesus said there's joy in heaven over amongst the angels about one sinner that repents. Repentance means I get it. I see, God, your way is right. I see you're good. I see you're just. I see you're reasonable. I hate that I've ever broken your law, and I, I want to be who you originally created me to be. I want to do it right. I love you, and I want to follow you. For such, the forgiveness of sins is a big deal when the boot comes, and my judgment day and your judgment day comes. We're either going to stand and give account for every single offense we've ever committed and be sufficiently and appropriately judged and punished for them or we will be completely forgiven, completely exonerated because we have put our faith in Christ. We have availed ourselves of this grace, this amazing grace. And so when we talk about God's grace, it's not just the psychological stuff that we need help with. We have actual guilt hanging over our heads and we want to turn to God, not in fear, but in faith because of his offer of grace. Listen to what the Apostle Paul said about himself in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. And this was the Apostle Paul. He says, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus, or Messiah Jesus, came into the world to save what? Sinners. Why did Jesus come? To save what? Sinners, do you feel uncomfortable owning yourself to be a sinner in need of Christ to save you? Because that's the only qualification for God's grace. We've got to be willing to own our sinfulness and our need of his grace. If we are like Simon and think that God owes us something because we're really good people. And you know what's cool about living in a world like this? You can always find somebody to compare yourself to. And, and, and no matter how, how bad you are or I am, I can always find myself someone that's a little worse. And I can say, well, I'm not so bad. You know, I'm better than him. <laughs> you know? But that's not the way God looks at it. 
he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth where in his complete righteousness and only those that love him, trust him, and want his righteousness, hunger and thirst after it, are going to be allowed in there. And so Paul says that God is in the business of saving sinners. I've got to own that title. And you've got to own that title to qualify for this salvation. He, he goes on to say this. He says, look. He says, um, he came into the world to save sinners, of whom I'm the worst. Paul said he was the worst. But for the very reason I was shown mercy, for that very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience. Notice that, unlimited patience. I love Brian's story. Brian says, I came to the Lord when I was seven years old, and then I just made a mess of things. But Jesus was still with me, and finally brings him back. Unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Titus in the New Testament, it says, At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior, notice Jesus is called God our Savior, he saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of what? His mercy. No one is going to stand in God's presence like Simon thought he would and say, hey, I'm here because I earned it. I, I, I'm, I'm here because if I've done everything you require, God. Simon was blinded to himself. He didn't see the truth about himself. He was blinded to the condition of that woman. He was blinded to Jesus who was God in flesh at his dinner table. He, he never saw it because of his own self-righteousness. But for those that are broken and humble and honest and willing to own their, their own undoneness, the door of grace is wide open. Ephesians 2, 8, it says, look, it says, For it is by grace, God's unmerited mercy and favor, you have been, past tense, you have been saved through what? Through faith. That's saying when you put your faith in Christ, when you say, let the rest of the world do it at once, I'm going to follow Jesus fully forever because I trust him. He loves me. He created me. He died on the cross for my sins. He rose from the grave and he's alive. I'm going to follow him. I know of no one better to follow than him. Everybody's following somebody. You are following somebody, either yourself or someone else. If you can find somebody better to follow than Jesus, follow them. But if not, what would be the reason that any rational person would give for not following Jesus, the most beautiful, the most intelligent life the planet has ever seen? It says we're saved by grace through faith, and that's not from ourselves. It is the gift of God, not by, what does it say? Works. So that no one can boast. No one's going to be standing in heaven saying, my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds. And that's why I'm here. Never is it going to be. You see, God's grace is available to anyone. Anyone can come to his kingdom. Anyone can be forgiven. Anyone can have a new life who's willing to come the way this woman came. And when we do come... This grace is not just available, it's capable. It is capable of getting inside of us and making changes inside of us that nothing else can make. Not fear, not reward, not guilt, not threat, not force. Only this grace can get inside the deepest parts of ourselves and literally start to recreate us, and it just keeps expanding. Let, let me tell you a little story that I thought up that I think exemplifies this. It might help you to get a hold of the power of this grace. Because the truth that I must confess to you about grace is this. Grace will absolutely either bring out the very best in each of us, or it will absolutely, absolutely bring out the worst. Uh, unfortunately, that, that is true. Follow my story. There was a guy who was an employee. We'll make it a guy. We don't want to insult the ladies, but it could have been a lady. Uh, who was an employee of a bank. And this particular guy was a horrible employee, a sorry employee. He had a bad attitude. He had bad work habits. He had bad attendance. He, he just was sorry. How many of you have ever worked with somebody that's just sorry? Can I say, yeah, okay, all right. If they're near you, don't, don't, don't stare. But, <laughs> uh, so word got back, you know, to the managers and so forth and all the way up to the very owner of the company. Uh, it, it was a bank. It was a bank and a lending institution altogether. You know, and this word gets, gets to the 
the, um, the very owner of the company, and uh, they say, we, we just got to get rid of this guy. This guy's a, a waste. And the, the owner says, no, 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 give him, give him some time. Let, let, him, let him develop some. So then one day, out of the blue, these robbers rush into the bank. They take everybody as hostages. The owner of the bank happens to be there that day, as well as the sorry rascal. And, and now the police are all surrounding the building, and these criminals... To get away, they make some demands, and to let the police know outside that they are not playing games, they decide they're going to kill one of the hostages and throw the hostage out the door to let the police know this is no game, this is no TV show, this is a real deal. And who do they grab? Lo and behold, they grab the sorry employee, and they're going to kill him and make an example of him. And he's begging, and he's screaming, please, please don't. And, and, and then all of a sudden, the owner of the company steps up and he begs these men don't kill him please don't kill him i will go kill me if you've got to kill somebody and as they're dragging the owner of the company away to kill him he tells the managers that are there he says listen i want you to make sure that this young man let it be known he has a job here in this company forever and they take the owner of the company and they shoot him in the head and they throw him out in the street to let the police know that they're serious now, the story has two endings. The first ending goes like this. The scene gets settled. You know, the police finally rush to place. They get him, and life goes on. The young man goes back to work at his job, and when he goes back to work, he's a changed man. He is sorrier than ever. He's got the worst attitude. He does even less than he did before. And whenever somebody says something to him, one of the managers, he says, yeah, I'll be here longer than you. Uh, the owner of the company said that I've got a job for life, so you, know, you can do what you want with me, but I'm here for good. And he gets worse and worse and worse because he knows he's untouchable. That's ending one. Ending two. The young man goes back to work, and once again, he is forever changed. There's no one that works harder. There's no one that's more loyal. There's no one that's more dedicated to the memory of the owner and the company he gives his entire life to serve, to express love and devotion. Why? Why? Because grace will either bring the worst out in us or the best. Listen, there are, in this room, I hate to say this, if you happen to be the one, probably better you hear it from me than you hear it on Judgment Day. But grace makes fools of some people. There are fools, perhaps in this very room, that think that grace means since Jesus paid for all my sins, <laughs> I, I've got a kind of sin-free card. I, I can just kind of go on and sinning, and, you know, I'm still going to go to heaven. I meet fools like that occasionally. I meet idiots like that occasionally. I meet stupid people that disgrace the goodness of God like that occasionally. And they only deceive themselves. They only fool themselves. They think that God's grace allows them to go on living worse and worse that's craziness, but grace will do that. It will bring out the worst in you because you know it's free or it brings out the best in you. You see, when grace gets a hold of your heart, it's like this woman. You just want to fall at the feet of your Savior. You want to be with him. You want to serve him. You want to give your life to him. You can never do enough for him. You want the world to know him and his goodness and his love. Nobody's forcing you. Nobody's threatening you. You're, you're not trying to buy any blessings. You love your God. You love his righteousness. You love his kingdom. And you would lay down your life gladly for it if necessary. That's what grace does when it gets inside of a welcoming heart. And that's what happened with this woman. To such, Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. Now, you and I have to ask ourselves, which are we? Which are we? Uh, has this grace gotten inside of your heart so that you so now love the Lord Jesus, love his righteousness, you pour out your life gladly, freely, joyfully for him? Or are you on the other side? It's like, well, I don't want to go to the prison colony, so I do want to be forgiven. So I think I've got myself a good deal. I'll sin now and get away later. It doesn't work that way. 
You see, grace will either bring the very best out in us or it'll bring the worst. What is it bringing out in me? That's what I've got to answer. God and I, what is it bringing out in you? Nobody's going to answer for either of us. It's between us and God. But the grace is free and God loves and he seeks us and he wants us to draw near to him in whatever condition we're in. We just have to own our condition and he'll forgive us freely and he'll start to transform us. Listen again to the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 speaking about himself. He said, look, I, I'm the least of the apostles and I don't even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Some of you that have read the book of Acts in chapter 8, you know that. He was the persecutor, the first persecutor of the church of Jesus before he turned to Jesus. He says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than them all, meaning the other apostles. Yet not I, but the, what does it say? The grace of God that was with me. What was he saying? He's saying that when he realized the love of God in Jesus, when he realized the goodness, it just grabbed a hold of him and it started to cleanse him and it started to change him and it started to motivate him. And that drove him, that energized him for the rest of his life. He, same Apostle Paul speaking in the book of Colossians. He said, we proclaim him, meaning Jesus, we proclaim him admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect or entire or complete in Christ. And then listen to what he says. To this end, I labor struggling with all his energy, Jesus' energy, which so powerfully works in me that's what grace does grace gets inside of us and it really brings a love of God and a love of righteousness and a love of people and it motivates us and it energizes us we want to serve God we want to serve others we want to give our lives away nobody's forcing us nobody's threatening us we're not trying to win any blessings grace gets inside and energizes us we have a great example of a man being transformed by Jesus grace in Luke's Gospel, chapter 5, a man called Levi, we better know him as Matthew, the writer of the Gospel of Matthew. Look how Jesus meets him. It says, after this, Jesus went out and he saw a tax collector. That was him. By the name of Levi, sitting at the tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said. Now, you, you have to understand that tax collectors in those days were traitors to the Israelites. They were working for the Roman government, and they were hated and despised. They were, they were thought to be evil through and through. And Jesus calls this evil guy. To come follow me. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house. And a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. So he's got this big sinful party going on. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors in, what's the word? Sinners. See, they, they were holier than God, holier than Jesus, so they thought. And Jesus answered them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. This grace gets inside and changes somebody. This, this tax collector becomes Matthew, the writer of the gospel of Matthew. Listen to Paul once again in Galatians 2.20. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. He was very alive when he said this. He was meaning in a spiritual sense. When Jesus died for his sins, he realized it was him that should have been on that cross instead of Jesus. He says, I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. This life I live in the body. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It was this self-giving sacrifice of Jesus that grabbed his heart. And it changed him through and through. He, he gave his whole life 30 years of service and finally a martyr's death to this Jesus. The same Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, he says, Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all. Jesus died for all. He died for all that those who live should no longer live for who? Themselves. Themselves. But for him who died for them. And was raised again. You see, grace makes this offer. I love you so much that I will die for you. And Jesus did. Now will you trust me? Now will you follow me? Grace offers. And it brings either the best or the worst out in us. The only question is, is which? Now, as I get ready to close out, um, it's highly likely that there's somebody in this room that 
you have tried all of your life in one way or another to erase from your mind a certain set of occurrences. Um, you, you press it down maybe successfully for some months or some years and then it comes back and you remember it again and you push it back and you remember it again. But you, you just can't ever quite escape from the regret, from the guilt, from the shame. And Jesus is here this morning just like he was there for that woman. He wants to be able to say to you when you leave here today, your sins are forgiven. Go in peace if you will put your faith in him. If you will repent of your self-directed sinful lifestyle now there are some that are already followers of Jesus but you also have gotten stuck you've you've made mistakes along the way you've been tripped up you've fallen you you've got some some things that have occurred you can't believe they occurred you you at times hate yourself you wish you could literally erase yourself or replay your life and there is no solution for that other than the sacrifice, the blood of Jesus and his word that your sins are forgiven. You've got to let it in. You've got to trust in his promise and you've got to accept his grace. And if you do, you can go like this woman did in peace. And that's his desire for everyone in this room. Let me close with a story about a lady named um, Shannon Etheridge. And uh, Shannon... She's pretty familiar, uh, pretty famous, actually. So, some of you ladies might have read some of her books. One of her uh, best-selling books was called Every Girl's Battle, Every Woman's Battle. It's actually been translated into three or four different languages. And she's pretty popular in the Christian circuit, you know, been on some Christian TV shows and so forth and so on. But you see her now, and you would never guess how she came to be what she is now. Shannon Etheridge, of course, she's a grown woman now. She's married, got children, and all that sort of thing. When she was 16 years old, she was not a follower of Christ. She was driving her car to school one morning and not paying attention, you know, as a teenager, learning to drive, you know, will do at times. Of course, we adults can do the same thing. She didn't see a lady named Marjorie uh, Jarfstar who was riding her bicycle on the road. Marjorie Jarstar was a translator for Wycliffe Bible Translators. They, they try to take all the languages in the world and translate the Bible into them so that everybody can have the Word of God. This woman had dedicated her life to serving Christ in this way. Well, Shannon hit her. She hit her on the bike, and uh, Marjorie Jarstar, this wonderful servant of God, she died. And so Shannon was just just blown away. I mean, you know, how can you, you're 16 years old, you've killed somebody. I mean, you, we can all imagine how horrible the kid felt. She was scared because there was negligence uh, in court. She didn't know what was going to go, you know, how it would go against her. Well, Marjorie Jarstar's husband, Gary, came to Shannon and he said, you can't let this ruin your life. God wants to do something in your life. I want you to take on Marjorie's legacy. Don't let her die in vain. I want you to serve God with complete abandon like my wife Marjorie did. He went to court. He fought for this kid. He got the charges dropped. And because of this grace that was given to her at a time when she had no excuse at all, uh, this woman's life was forever changed. And now she goes and she presents the grace and the love of Christ to the thousands of people around the world, but it all started when she herself first received an act of grace when she most needed it. I bet you there's somebody in here that really needs it today. I bet you there's somebody in here that the very thought of remembering a certain set of circumstances or deeds or occurrences, it makes you feel so uncomfortable you almost wish you could erase yourself. Only acceptance of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ can ever thoroughly and completely bring the interior healing that you really ache for and that God is here this morning wanting to give you. So, two things. If you've never put your faith in Christ, made your decision to be his follower, I hope you'll do that before you leave. Nobody can do it for you. It's no ritual. There's no con you can play on God. It's all or nothing. You trust him completely and follow him fully forever or not. But if you do, you'll never regret it. And his grace is available. Some of us, we're already his followers, but we've got to let that.
that grace get into the deepest parts of ourself. Sometimes it feels too good to be true, but it's not. It's his amazing grace. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for this display of your amazing heart, your amazing grace, and how we need it. How hungry we are to know that no matter what condition we're in, no matter how helpless, how soiled, how guilty, how shame-filled we may be, that your love is ever there. Your willingness to forgive us and to cleanse us and to restore us is always available. Please, Father, in this moment, help each and every person in this room hear your voice, receive your love, and may we all leave here never, ever the same. I ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.